are listening to Grim and Stone, The Mountain Perspective. This podcast may contain objectionable language. Welcome to Grim and Stone, The Mountain Perspective. This is our take on what's happening in the world. How you doing, Stoney? I'm okay. <laughs> That's all you're getting. That's all I'm getting. Fair enough. All right. Let's see here. Let's get right into this. Now, I'm not going to read the whole article because it's long. But uh, basically what we have here is a female rescue swimmer makes Coast Guard history. And this is the first person, the first female, to graduate uh, from the Aviation Survival, Survival Man School. Um, in 1986, they had their first female to graduate from uh, the Navy Rescue Swim School. 27 years later, they had a young woman, and I had her name here somewhere. There she is, Chief Petty Officer Karen Voorhees. Uh, she graduated 27, uh, 27 years later, first aviation survival technician promoted to the rank of Chief Petty Officer. Basically, what the uh, uh, Coast Guard had done was not lowered standards for women. And if you want to do this job, you will. these are the standards that are set, and you will follow these standards or you won't get in. Works for me. So, took them 27 years, but they got a woman in there. Yeah. So, good for her. Well, that's one of the things that we always complained about on active duty was uh, there, there wasn't a set... Other other than PT tests, there wasn't a set standard separating male and female for job performance. But that's the way everything worked. Yeah. And uh, you and I, among many, many others, found that unacceptable. If, you, if your job is blah, 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 you damn well do that job or you go somewhere else. Exactly. But good for her. Yep, Chief Petty Officer Karen Voorhees. Good for her. All right, World War II fly girl to finally get military honors. Marie Mitchell, uh, back in 1944, uh, she was a member of the WASPs. And there was a definition of wasp here somewhere women's auxiliary fairy squadron and um, that was that was wasp first <laughs> <laughs> but it was part of the wasp program and uh, one thing that I learned today that I did not know was that the uh, the women of the wasps were not considered part of the military they were not eligible for any military benefits or veteran benefits. And it wasn't until uh, President Carter in 77 that said the women were eligible for veteran benefits. And in 84, they were uh, the WASPs were awarded the American Campaign Medal and World War II Victory Medal. And uh, in 2009... President Obama signed legislation awarding them the Congressional Gold Medal. But anyway, this woman, uh, Marie Mitchell, ended up secretly wedding a surgeon. And uh, she, she happened to die two weeks after her, her marriage to this guy. Wow. Her plane crashed in, uh, where the hell was that? Here we go. Plane crash during a training flight over the Mojave Desert in California. And I believe it was not too terribly long ago, 2005, the shifting sands of the Mojave Desert unearthed Marie's wedding ring, her pilot wings, and identification bracelet, and her watch. Uh, amateur aviation archaeologists discover the remnants and track them to Marie. 
And the family donated these items to the uh, Women in Military Service for uh, American America Memorial outside the gates of the Arlington National Cemetery. Very cool. But uh, this was put out on, what, the 27th? And uh, during the ceremony at Whitechapel, uh, Michelle, uh, Mitchell's grave marker, weathered by time, will be surrounded by 37 American flags to signify the other pioneering wasps who died in service. Uh, and there will be about 400 full size, or there will there was 400 full size American flags, uh, which will line the cemetery's roadway. So, Marie Mitchell Robinson. A big salute to you and your service back in the Wasps. And she finally, after all these years, since 1944, uh, finally got recognized for her military service. Great. Kudos to her and her family. And let's see here. Should we do the uh, famous vet or you want to do yours first? Oh, no. Go ahead. Famous vet. Look at that. Yep. Now, I'm going to read the citation. Now, you can you know who it is. But uh, I'll tell you what. I'll just go ahead and just give it all out right at the beginning here. Um, Audie Leon Murphy. He was born in 1925 in uh, Kingston, Hunt County, Texas. And uh, ended up dying uh, May 28th, 1971, in a uh, private airplane crash oh. at the age of 45. And uh, it was him and four others, the pilot and three or four other people who were on the plane. But his military service, this, like I said, this is our famous vet, Audie Murphy. Uh, okay, here we go. He tried to enlist in the Marines and Army paratroopers, but was disqualified because of weight requirements. <laughs> the Navy also turned him down for being underweight. He was finally accepted into the uh, infantry by the Army. And uh, let's see, he was inducted at uh, Greenville. And on June 30th, 1942, was sent to Camp Walters, Texas, for basic training. And uh, this is, is kind of neat. During basic training, he earned his, he earned his marksman uh, badge uh, with rifle component bar and expert badge with uh, bayonet component bar. And he always envisioned himself as a, uh, a glider pilot. That's kind of a weird sentence, just a chuck in there. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, during a session of close order drill, he passed out, which we've all seen. Hell yeah. Locked those knees. Locked his knees. And was nicknamed Baby. And his company commander tried to have him transferred to a cook and baker <laughs> school. But Murphy insisted on becoming a combat soldier. After 13 weeks of basic training, he was sent to Fort Meade, Maryland for advanced infantry training. So, his career started off less than stellar. <laughs> Baby. Baby. Uh, on, no, on February 20th, 1943, he arrived in Casablanca, Morocco, in North Africa. I'm not going to read all the details of all the stuff he did, but let's let's see here. Uh, during his time in Morocco, they would for training they would do 30 mile uh, marches in a time frame of, of eight hours. This was known as the Truscott Trot, and uh, that's because Major General Truscott thought that these drills were good. <laughs> but anyway, the the Truscott Trot consisted of, like I said, it's a thirty mile frigging march. First hour, men are marched at a pace of five miles an hour, and then for the second hour, it's four miles an hour, and then every hour 
after that, it's 3.5 miles per hour. No. <laughs> <laughs> I, 30 miles in eight hours. Kiss my ass. Yeah, that, that's not happening. They underwent bayonet training, an obstacle course, landmine uh, training. Uh, in Algeria, uh, Murphy was promoted to private first class on May 7th. Let's see, after the surrender of the Af uh, Ger uh, German Africa Corps, um, he was put in charge of prisoners at Tunisia. They returned to Algeria on May 15th for final training in the assault uh, landing in Sicily. Uh, during the full rehearsal named Operation Copycat on, let's see, July 7th, they embarked for Sicily. Let's see here. Then they go to, then, then he goes to Sicily and mainland Italy. Let's see here. I'm trying, I'm trying to condense this as much as possible. Uh, looks like this is where he killed his first people. Or his first encounter with with combat. His combat initially came when he took part in the invasion of Sicily on July 10th, 1943. After killing two Italian officers, Murphy's response to a fellow soldier's shocked reaction was, It is not easy to shed the idea that human life is sacred. We have been put into the field to deal out death. It's kind of profound and uh, he was made a, uh, a headquarters runner but he kept slipping out to do scouting missions oh <laughs> <laughs> uh, let's see what else did he do has did he do let's see oh here here's a, a a nice observation and this is a quote from Audie Murphy I have seen war as it actually is and I do not like it. Uh, then off to Palermo. And let's see here. Uh, da, 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 da. Good Lord, he was everywhere. Uh, Anzio. Uh, he was promoted to sergeant uh, December 13th, 1943. And underwent uh, rehearsals in 1944 for the storming of the Anzio beachhead. Da, do, do. Oh, he ended up missing the initial landing because of, of malaria. But upon release from uh, the hospital, so he was promoted to staff sergeant. Good Lord. I, it's just, there's so much here that he did. Uh, the European theater. Part of Operation Dragoon? Good Lord. Um, Montelamar, France. Northeastern France. I'm going to guess that's pronounced Holzwehr. Like you would say it in German. France. It just... He was fucking everywhere. <laughs> and... And fighting too. And fighting the whole frigging time. <laughs> but he ended up. It was thirty. What was it? Thirty-two. It was. It was somewhere on here. I believe it was thirty-two medals. Overall, and one of them was the Medal of Honor. And I'm going to read a citation. Second Lieutenant Murphy. Commanded Company B. Yeah, oh, yeah, by the way, he also got promoted to lieutenant during all of this. Uh, commanded Company B, which was attacked by six tanks and waves of infantry. Second Lieutenant Murphy ordered his men to withdraw uh, to prepare a position in the woods. While he remained forward at his command post and continued to give fire directions to artillery by telephone. Behind him to his right, one of our tank destroyers received a direct hit and began to burn. 
Its crew withdrew into the woods. Second Lieutenant Murphy continued to direct artillery fire, which killed large number of advancing enemy infantry. With the enemy tanks abreast his position, Second Lieutenant Murphy climbed onto the burning tank destroyer, which was in danger of blowing up at any moment, and employed its 50 caliber machine gun against the enemy. He was alone and exposed to German fire from three sides, but his deadly fire killed dozens of Germans and caused their infantry tra attack to waver. The enemy tanks, losing infantry support, began to fall back. For an hour, the Germans tried an hour, an hour. <laughs> the Germans tried every available weapon to eliminate Second Lieutenant Murphy, but he continued to hold his position and wiped out a squad that was trying to creep up unnoticed on his right flank. Germans reached as close as 10 yards, only to be mowed down by his fire. He received a leg wound, but ignored it and continued his single-handed fight until his ammunition was exhausted. He then made his way back to his company, refused medical attention, and organized the company in a counterattack, which forced the Germans to withdraw. His directing of artillery fire wiped out many of the enemy. He killed or wounded about 50. That was just personally. Second Lieutenant Murphy's indomitable courage and his refusal to give an inch of ground saved his company from possible encirclement and destruction and enabled it to hold the woods which had been the enemy's objective. That's one bad son of a bitch. Yeah. <laughs> it, because he was a lieutenant, it, the thought keeps crossing my mind. Here, here is a valuable lesson for all you guys with your physical education and history degrees that joined the Army directly as a second lieutenant. Yeah, you ain't shit, so shut up and pay attention to your staff sergeants and sergeants and your more experienced soldiers. You ain't Audie Murphy. <laughs> no. no kidding. I mean, Audie Murphy, he started as a Zippy E1 private. Yeah. Ended up making it to second lieutenant in the regular army, and then he made it to major in the National Guard. And let's see here. Just a little bit extra on our famous vet of the day. Uh, Murphy suffered from severe PTSD, but back in the day they called it battle fatigue. And he called on the government he was a very outspoken. Um, after World War II in Korea, you know, for the veterans, uh, he called on the government to give increased consideration to the study of the emotional impact that combat experiences uh, have on veterans, and to extend health care benefits to address PTSD and other mental problems suffered by uh, returning war veterans. So even back then, he was. You know, he was like one of the first advocates for for PTSD. Well, that quote there. Uh, oh, this one right here? I mean, it's still true now. After the war, they took army dogs and rehabilitated them for civilian life. But they turned soldiers into civilians immediately and let them sink or swim. Yeah, that's the way it still is. He also wrote a book in 1949 called To Hell and Back. Uh, this was his memoirs of World War II. And uh, he eventually ended up becoming a uh, film star. Starred in 44 films, most of them westerns. And eventually ended up starring in his own His own book, his movie. <laughs> Audie Murphy starring as Audie Murphy. Yeah, Audie Murphy starring as Audie, Audie Murphy in To Hell and Back. Now, this was neat. The film was the biggest hit Universal Studios had in history. The record remained unbroken until 1975 when Steven Spielberg's Jaws became the highest, became a higher grossing film. 20 years. Wow. 
but uh, that's very very cool. He was a songwriter. He was a poet. He was a uh, an author, a uh, movie star, and a hero, and a frigging hero and a half. I mean, I'm going to put links in the description to this. It, it's well worth the read. I read most of it, and it's insane what this guy went through. So, and there's a one hell of a picture of him with his chest of medals, and oh. Uh, by the way, he was only 21 when he got out of the service. <laughs> <laughs> 21. That's why I always keep saying war is a young man's game. One hell of an awesome man to look up to. Alrighty. So, big salute to Audie Murphy. Okay. Uh... Here's a story. The sonar, a sonar image may show Amelia Earhart's plane. Uh, the International Group for Historic Aircraft Recovery, uh, which has been on the hunt for Earhart's plane for 25 years, uh, found something by a remote underwater vehicle uh, that appears to be an anomaly. It's in the site they suspect that her plane went down. Um, the most prominent part of the anomaly appears to be less than, less than 32 feet long. Uh, and they note that the plane was 38 feet, seven inches long. She was the first, Earhart was the first female pilot to cross the Atlantic solo, uh, and disappeared while trying to circumnavigate the globe in her plane in 1937. And... The hunt for her and her plane have been on since then, but they believe that they found it. They're they're raising money to uh, find the site. Uh, they say three million dollars is needed to further investigate the site. Well, it's six hundred feet down, so yeah. Uh, but that's pretty exciting. They think they may have found her plane. Don't know. They got to raise the money and see if they can find it. Uh, it's, that's it's pretty cool. Wow. Uh, and we'll go to a, a story that first thing I thought of when I read this one was finally somebody's realized that we need to you know put some uh, put some scaffolding and framework around the the future hopes of America. <laughs> in, okay. Instead of producing educated idiots uh, the spelling bee mixes it up with vocabulary requirements national harbor maryland the scripps national spelling bee which is the one that's on tv mm -hmm. uh, it's a big deal uh began tuesday last week i think no tuesday this week in maryland they added a new wrinkle to compare to for competitors by requiring them to know the definitions of words. Oh, so instead of just having these little <laughs> idiot savants up there who are spouting off how to spell yes, they're histoplasmosis, they have to know what it means. That's right, right. Now, uh, the reason for the change is all, expand, is all about extending the bee's commitment to its purpose, which has long been not only to help students improve their spelling, but to increase vocabulary, learn concepts, and develop correct English usage. Yo. <laughs> <laughs> I had to throw that in there. <coughs> it, it drives me nuts. You know it does. And uh, Words have meaning. They do. And when you can't, I mean, it's bad enough. Spelling is insane, but it's bad enough when you misspell a word constantly but you don't even know what the word means oh what, yeah what the okay anyway um competitors including uh, sanat mishra <laughs> said they don't understand the rule change says mishra it doesn't make sense i don't get the rule 
It's pretty clear, Mishra. If you don't know what the word means, um, you're an educated idiot. Yeah. Have a nice day. Have a nice day. Okay. Yeah, see, I'm one of those people where if I find myself spelling something wrong, like for years, I thought at least was one word. Huh? Don't know why, yeah. but I did. And then it was pointed out to me. No, that's two words, you moron. I don't make that mistake anymore. Yeah. You know, and I looked it up and, oh, by God, they were right. And I've been wrong all this time. And, I, and I'm kind of a spelling Nazi that way. I... Spelling drives me nuts. In fact, one of the stories I skipped today was about a guy threatening to blow up a state building because the uh, sign was misspelled. <laughs> uh, it was an education department building. And anyway, wow. I, um, <laughs> <laughs> and real quick here, this is uh, to me. This is pretty cool. Um, one of my one of my personal heroes. Uh, I went to eaglerarelife.com. Uh, now, this is a contest sponsored by uh, Rare Life uh, Kentucky Straight Bourbon Whiskey. Okay. I'm not a drinker, but, you know, this is very cool. Because it's called Rare, they have this contest uh, called Lead a Rare Life, and it you can nominate... Uh, people who, in your mind, have put themselves out there mm -hmm. in positions of exceptional service. Right. I nominated Sean J. Gorley. Uh, she's the wife of Justin Gorley, and she's the, the founder of a, a group on Facebook that I use constantly. Mm -hmm. called Military with PTSD. Uh, her husband's a Navy vet. He served over in uh, Enduring, Enduring Freedom and, and uh, Iraqi Freedom uh, Middle Eastern War. And when he came home, they were having issues. And they were like, okay, this isn't right because we weren't like this before. And and Sean dug in, and she talked to people and did everything she could to figure out what was going on. And her husband, to his credit, was very supportive and, and tried to help her figure out what what's going on. Why? Oh, I, I, I like them. You know. they're, they're, they're both very nice people. I, I like the part, part point that he, he recognized there was a problem. Yeah. And she was willing to fix it, and he's like, yeah, there's... Something wrong with me. Absolutely. Help me. And so they stuck it out. She ended up writing a book uh, called The War at Home, One Family's Fight Against PTSD. And uh, I highly recommend that you get the book. She's been to Congress. Uh, she's talked to VA uh, representatives. She's been on TV, newspaper, and on and on and on, pushing for... Uh, more support for PTSD vets and, equally important, their families. Mm -hmm. uh, I know I, I, I'll, I'll partially credit one of my divorces uh, to PTSD. There was just such a gap between her and I that it... it there was we were beyond repairing it. Yeah. But uh, anyway, Sean J. Gorley, I I, uh, I nominated her for the Eagle Rare Life Award because she and her husband Justin are are true American heroes. They're looking out for the veterans and their families on this issue of PTSD. So find the link down below to Eagle Rare Life and go vote for Sean. Um, she really, really deserves to be recognized for her effort. In fact, I was online last night, and it where she's at, it was maybe one thirty, two o'clock in the morning, and she was talking. She was with a vet, talking about the issues he's, he was having. Mm -hmm. Holy cow! 
you know, I mean, they, she's dedicated. So very dedicated. Find very the link and go vote. All right. Yeah, they're 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 good folks. I I use that site myself a lot, and uh, it's one of those where I'll go there and go, huh, I don't have it quite so bad, or you need to quit whining and suck it up, Buttercup. You yeah. know, either either way. <laughs> <laughs> But uh, today what we're going to do, uh, because we missed the Memorial Day show, uh, I think we had other things on our minds that kind of prevented us from doing the show, but uh, that's why we did the big Audie Murphy thing, and why today we're doing weather from Arlington Cemetery. And right now it is 86 degrees, winds out of the south-southeast at 11 miles an hour, 50% humidity. Today they're looking at a high of 91 with winds out of the south at 11 miles an hour with a humidity of 43%. And tonight we're looking at a low of 71 with uh, winds out of the south-southwest at 9 miles an hour with a uh, humidity of 66%. So, uh, it's a pretty nice day. Pretty nice day. A little warm for my taste. Yep. But... Uh, but if you're there, you're in good shape to go visit the Arlington Cemetery and pay yes, your you respects. Are. So that about does it for me. You got anything else? Nope. I am toasted. All righty. We are out of here. And today is Thursday. So <laughs> <laughs> he just saw me mouse over the little calendar thing so I could verify what day it was. Uh, so everybody else have a good weekend. And... Uh, Tony, I will, I'm seeing you right now, and everybody else will see you on Monday. Have a good weekend. Keep your powder dry. <laughs>